we, we we need to shut down the videos during the during the opening because we're gonna, we're gonna show some some media and okay uh, so we, we yeah and that would be it and after we finish the videos then you can uh, start sharing your screen and turn off your video microphone because i'm going to introduce you to the audience and then you you'll start your talk okay okay so for the moment i should yeah i'm gonna turn off my video too okay. and and uh and my microphone too because we're gonna we're gonna open the broadcast to all the audience for the people to connect if you could yeah stop I'm... sharing your screen yeah give me one yeah second. yeah no no worries no worries yeah uh stop video and yeah perfect Thank you. Reciban un cordial saludo todos los participantes y los panelistas de la versión 2021 del IWBC Congreso de Neurocirugía que se realizará en el Hospital Universitario de La Samaritana vía Zoom desde el 27 hasta el 29 de mayo del año 2021, en el cual participarán 32 conferencistas de las mejores universidades del mundo, llegando a cerca de 130 países. Durante ese congreso tenemos la innovación de dos cursos para el congreso, de columna vertebral, uno de ellos desde Sutter, USA, el día 26 de mayo. Agradecemos la participación de todos en todas las partes del mundo, de las diferentes ciudades, sean todos bienvenidos. Muy buenos días. Como presidente de MERI es un orgullo darle la bienvenida a la segunda versión del Congreso Internacional de Neurocirugía, congreso en el cual participan 32 conferencistas de las mejores universidades del mundo y que nos permite llegar a más de 130 países. Este espacio de conocimiento ratifica nuestra misión de poder transformar la sociedad generando innovación y sobre todo haciendo modelos y procesos centrados en los pacientes. Muy bienvenidos y muchos éxitos. Buenos días. Queremos darle la bienvenida al International Web de Neurosurgery Surgery Congress 2021. Es un placer estar nuevamente este año con ustedes en esta nueva edición Contaremos con 32 neurocirujanos renombrados de las mejores universidades del mundo en las diferentes subespecialidades y con temas fascinantes. Este año tendremos dos nuevas modalidades académicas. Una de ellas es la sesión de e-poster video. La otra fueron nuestros cursos precongresos, los cuales se presentaron en el día de ayer. Uno de ellos transmitido desde Seattle Sci Foundation con técnicas de cirugía de columna. El otro, principios de balance sagital desde el 100, con una gran asistencia. Los invitamos a verlos en nuestra página. Nuestro principal fin es el de aportar a la educación del mundo neuroquirúrgico y continuar construyendo lazos con la comunidad académica y científica. Por último, agradecemos especialmente a Seattle Sci Foundation, bajo el liderazgo del Dr. 
Prod Oscuria, a nuestros prestigiosos speakers de Europa, Asia, África, Canadá, Estados Unidos y Latinoamérica, el hacer este sueño una realidad. Extendemos nuestra gratitud a los participantes y esperamos llenar sus expectativas. Al grupo de neurocirugía de nuestras instituciones, Hospital Universitario Mayor Medellín, Hospital Universitario Barrios Unidos, Hospital Universitario La Samaritana, Universidad de Rosario y al 100. Nuevamente bienvenidos, disfruten de esta experiencia. Gracias. Good morning to all speakers and attendees. Last year, the Center for Research and Training in Neurosurgery, CIEM, launched the 2020 International Web-Based Neurosurgery Congress, the 2020 IWBNC. It hosted 25 internationally renowned speakers and offered 30 top of the line lectures, reaching 3,096 participants from 125 different countries and registering up to 22,266 live stream views and more than 9,500 delayed views on our YouTube channel. This year, we proudly announced a new edition, the 2021 IWBNC. Hosting 34 world-renowned neurosurgeons and spine surgeons, the 2021 IWBNC offers a high-quality scientific program and two novel academic modalities. First, it posters video presentations from authors all over the world, currently available on our website for all the audience to see. Second, a pre-Congress course successfully developed yesterday, which included live cardiac demonstrations on advanced lateral approaches to the spine by the Seattle Science Foundation and an interactive workshop on the basics of the sidal balance of the spine. We are grateful to all the speakers and the Seattle Science Foundation for the support and partnership in achieving such a high profile Congress. Please be welcome and enjoy this educational experience. We have the honor today of having Dr. Jeffrey Wissoff. Dr. Wissoff is a well-known pediatric neurosurgeon at Hassenfeld Children's Hospital, New York School of Medicine. He's an associate professor of neurosurgery and pediatrics at the New York University Langone Medical Center. Right now at the 2021 IWBNC, Dr. Wissoff is going to share a lecture on indications for surgical resection in chiasmatic hypothalamic gliomas. Please, Type write your questions in the Q&A panel. We will read them after the end of Dr. Wissoff's intervention. Welcome, Dr. Wissoff, and thank you. It's all yours. Thank you. It's an honor to be here again. Um, it's very exciting. Last year's Congress was quite amazing, and this year's appears to be equal, if not better. Uh, particularly, thank you to Professor Riveros for the invitation. Last year, I had the opportunity to speak about low-grade gliomas in childhood and the surgical management. And I thought this year we would drill down on a bit more controversial talk that is indications for surgical management in optic pathway gliomas. Optic pathway gliomas comprise a spectrum of lesions from tubular thickening of the optic nerves to massive exophytic tumors of the hypothalamus. Currently, the oncology perspective is that chemotherapy is the most effective or more effective treatment, and it's definitely the most common treatment that's offered worldwide, and often is considered the only possible treatment. There is no question that over the last three decades, the disease is diagnosed at an earlier stage as a result of improved diagnostic techniques, particularly MRI and earlier utilization of MRI. The oncologist's perspective is that since a gross total resection cannot be performed in these tumors, and we would never attempt to resect that which is intrinsic, surgery really has minimal, if any, role. But I think to some degree, this is a bit of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. That is, you throw out the old and what is possibly valuable, as this woodcut from Germany in the 16th century demonstrates, not exactly something we want to do, either as neurosurgeons and particularly as pediatric neurosurgeons. So the questions that I'd like to offer today is surgery limited to diagnostic biopsies to guide choice of chemotherapy or molecular targets, or is there a role for resective surgery 
in these lesions. These uh, optic pathway tumors occupy about 50% of the supracellular tumors of childhood and overall are about 7% of all pediatric tumors. As we look at these tumors, it's a good idea to think of a classification system. How will you break them down anatomically? There have been a number of systems that have been offered. This is just a variation of one of them, which I find relatively straightforward. That is to divide them into prechiasmatic, diffuse chiasmatic, and exophytic chiasmatic tumors. Among the prechiasmatic is you have the purely Um, the, among the uh, pre-cosmatic tumors, the orbital and intracanulicular are unique uh, compared to the bilateral tumors, as we see here. There's a bilateral one. The diffuse tumors are just that, globular enlargement of the um, optic chiasm. And the exophytic tumors extend up into the third ventricle as well as into the supracellular cistern. pre tumors are very easy. This, uh, the surgical uh, treatment of this has been well established for over four decades, and really chemotherapy has not changed this significantly. The tumors that are amenable to surgical resection are those that are unilateral, where you have proptosis that threatens the health of the globe, the eye is blind, or that you have progressive and severe visual loss with unrelenting tumor growth on MRI. When the tumor stops before the optic chiasm, surgery is definitely curative. And this is the typical appearance that we see. This is the intraorbital portion of the tumor where it's isolated at the back of the globe. Uh, and we will simply amputate it just beyond the globe and then go intracranial, drill out the optic canal and identify the tumor about four millimeters distal to the optic canal intradural divide it and remove the entire lesion on moss. This immediately relieves the proptosis, protects the globe and cures the tumor. It is exceptionally rare for new tumor to arise distal to where you've resected it within the um, optic nerve intracranially. Diffuse chiasmatic tumors are more problematic. Um, no question that the most common indication or most common presentation or in children with neurofibromatosis. They will have diffuse enlargement of the chiasm. There'll be T2 signal on flare or T2 imaging extending in a uh, diffuse and infiltrative pattern into the optic tracts. And when you see this typical appearance, there is no indication for surgery upfront. These tumors in the neurofibromatosis population can be incredibly indolent and in spite of looking like their widespread disease, in fact, have little or no deficit and visual function may remain stable for a prolonged period of time. There are three indications for biopsy up front. One, if you have an atypical presentation or if you have a focal mass without tract involvement. Germ cell tumor is the most common imitator of an optic pathway tumor, but remember, histiocytosis and sarcoidosis can both present in a similar fashion. All three of these can have some degree of T2 signal in the optic tracts. One of the keys to suspecting that this is not a diffuse glioma is the presence of diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus is very rare with diffuse optic pathway tumors and far more common with germ cell tumors, histiocytosis, and sarcoidosis. The other reason for biopsy is to obtain tissue for molecular diagnosis and targeted therapy. Ultimately, the decision whether or not to go for treatment depends upon the patient's clinical status. If the tumor is discovered incidentally, particularly in neurofibromatosis, and you have good visual function and the child is a reliable patient that can be followed with serial visual acuity and visual field examinations and observation is appropriate. Chemotherapy now has a nearly 35 year record of efficacy and we'll talk a bit more about it later on. 
And the current status is the use of targeted therapy with either BRAF or MEK inhibitors. And we'll mention that briefly later on as well. Those tumors that are exophytic uh, from the chiasm and hypothalamus are amenable to surgical resection. And there have been publications dating back into the mid 80s describing radical but not complete resection. The rationale for surgery of these exophytic tumors basically is to decompress the optic nerves since often the optic nerves themselves are not involved with the disease, but are rather secondarily stretched and compressed by the exophytic tumor. To decompress the third ventricle and avoid hydrocephalus and the need for a shunt. And particularly in infants, there are often associated large arachnoid cysts in the temporal regions. The arachnoid cysts are true arachnoid cysts. They are not tumor cysts and speak to the developmental nature of these tumors in young uh, children. But ultimately the question is, are we doing anything than an immediate relief of mass effect and can surgery alone prolong progression-free survival? And here's a typical appearance in a um, six-month-old of a large tumor, obviously congenital in nature, with these arachnoid cysts, which in and of themselves are causing significant brain compression, mass effect, and neurologic deficit, in this case, a hemiparesis. So we're going to review my personal experience and talk a little bit about the literature. Uh, my experience will date, uh, will stop the series about four years ago. So we have some follow-up in all of the patients. And a little bit later on, we'll talk about long-term follow-up in a subset of these patients. Overall, about 25% uh, of the children were less than two years of age at presentation. About 70% were between two and 21. And we had 10 adults. Most of these were under 25, but we had three patients who were older. One who was 31, one 33, and the oldest patient who was 44. Oops. Sorry about that. The clinical presentation was pretty much what one would expect with supercellar disease. Um, the patient's complaints at about a third of the cases were visual disturbances. About a quarter of the patients had focal neurologic deficits, either a hemiparesis or an extraocular movement palsy. Hormonal disturbances, however, as a complaint were relatively uncommon. Only 14% of these had abnormal um, hormonal status at presentation. Diacephalic syndrome was seen almost exclusively in ch children under two years of age. And although it was 11% of the overall series, if you remember, there are roughly 30 children in the under two year of age category. So among those under two, it was actually one third of the children presented with diencephalic syndrome. Headaches and raised intracranial pressure were actually relatively rare, less than 10%. And in 8%, it was unclear why they presented. They had other non-neurologic disease for which they received an MRI scan. On formal examination, however, over half of these patients had significant visual impairment on presentation. Only 16% were completely normal. When we think of the surgical strategy in these tumors, in many ways, they're, the strategy is comparable to those that we would use for um, tumors arising from the skull base or within the third ventricle that are not necessarily infiltrative. When we had exophytic supracellar tumors, which was about 60% of the overall population, it was an terional or orbitozygomatic craniotomy wide dissection of the sylvian fissure, distally identifying the normal vascular anatomy following the middle cerebral branches to the middle cerebral artery trunk, following that back to the carotid bifurcation and then to the carotid artery. The vascular anatomy is the constant in this area, 
whereas the optic nerves, optic chiasm, and optic tract can be significantly distorted. And you use your vascular anatomy to identify where you are. Identifying the optic apparatus comes after the vascular structures have been well dissected free. And then extensive arachnoidal dissection, just as one would dissect around a meningioma or craniopharyngioma in the skull base. And once you've dissected everything free from the circle of Willis, and you have the exophytic component coming out of the optic chiasm and hypothalamus or the optic nerves, then you go ahead and do your internal tumor resection and continue to roll the capsule of the tumor on itself until you're able to remove all the tumor from the supracellar cistern. This was the second child that I operated on now 35 years ago. This was a three-year-old female who presented uh, with uh, amblyopia. And you can see how old it is. Uh, these scans are. This was before we were using gadolinium in children. And you can see the large tumor arising from the chiasm and extending down into the supracellar cistern. At surgery, we can see the right optic nerve and carotid artery displaced laterally, the tumor here, and we don't even see the optic chiasm, which is displaced posteriorly. After maximal resection, we can now see the right optic nerve, a little bit of the left optic nerve here, the left third nerve in the distance, and this large um, cavity, basically clearing out the entire supracellar cistern. Just hidden within a little bit of fluid here is the uh, pituitary stalk, which remains intact. And there's our post-op scan and compare it with our preoperative scan. No question there is residual disease. However, this child remained radiographically and clinically stable, uh, did not require hormone replacement therapy, and ultimately went to university, at which point, uh, approximately 18 years after surgery, she was lost to follow-up. So this was one of the early patients I operated on, one of the ones that gave me a lot of confidence that in fact, a large number of these tumors are extrinsically compressing the optic nerves and we can achieve significant resection, decompression, and in fact, long-term progression-free survival. So let's go through a few other patients as examples. This was a 15-year-old boy who presented with an altered visual examination and had a right uh, incongruous uh, hemianopsia. Uh, you can see here we have a tumor arising from the chiasm and a bit of the left optic tract extending into the supracellar cistern. At surgery, we're seeing a similar picture to our last one, except this one, is, since it's arising more laterally, it's displacing the left optic nerve medially, stretching the uh, left carotid artery. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, and we can see the anterior cerebral artery on the left, the middle cerebral artery on the left, posterior communicator. Um, and we once again are able to get a very radical resection. Uh, those of you who are paying attention can see a surgical error on my part. You can see that the anterior cerebral is narrowed right here. I did cause an avulsion of one of the perforators uh, during surgery, which was fortunately able to be controlled easily. Uh, as a result of this perforation, the child had a small infarct in the chordate and had a transient uh, aphasia that lasted about four days. And by two weeks after surgery, all of his neurologic deficits had resolved. And he remained stable now going on to 15 years after treatment. Uh, those of you again who are paying attention will say, well, wait a second, isn't this the wrong side? No, basically when I took the picture, I turned it backwards. So this still is the left side that we're looking at in our resection cavity. So no question, there is residual disease. Although there is a radical resection, the optic nerves are decompressed, the vascular system is decompressed, and we're having prolonged progression-free survival, both clinically and radiographically. 14-year-old girl uh, presented 
12 years ago. Uh, she was one of the ones who actually did present with endocrine deficits and was being worked up for precocious puberty when this uh, tumor was found. Uh, we were able to do a relatively radical internal debulking of the tumor. And this particular image here is five years post-op in 2015. And she remains clinically stable seven years later. Uh, her precocious puberty was actually resolved following surgeries. This is 2010, 2015. Um, this was an eight-year-old male who presented now 18 years ago. He's now 26 uh, with this large tumor rising from the right optic tract. And interesting, he presented actually with psychiatric symptomatology and a relatively dense um, left homonymous hemianopsia. We we're able to resect the majority of the tumor. Uh, and he again has remained stable. Interestingly, his postoperative course was complicated by psychosis for about a week and a half, and then it resolved spontaneously. He has subsequently done well, completed high school, attended a technical university, and is employed in his mid 20s. Uh, he does take thyroid replacement therapy, but no other hormonal replacement therapy. This is an interesting example of what we can do with children who have previously been treated. So this is a girl with neurofibromatosis who had uh, a focal tumor that arose within a bed of more diffuse disease. She had been treated at about 12 years of age with carboplatin and vincristine chemotherapy for a progressive diffuse optic pathway tumor involving the chiasm, the nerves, and both optic tracts. She remained stable for six years here in 2011. And then two years later, she had this progressive enlargement of a cystic and solid tumor arising within the field of disease that had been previously treated with chemotherapy. Given the mass effect and a new hemiparesis, we elected to surgically resect this component of the tumor arising from the optic tract and again, two years later, we were able to get not only an excellent resection, but no evidence of disease. And she has, and she has also remained stable for the ensuing six years without any recurrence in this site and without any additional adjuvant therapy. So these treatments can be used following previous neoadjuvant chemotherapy. This to me is perhaps one of the most interesting patients and one that sort of breaks all the rules that most neurosurgeons learn. We've so far been talking about a pediatric population and I'm sure everyone in the audience will agree that among those with pilocytic astrocytomas, they can have an incredibly indolent course regardless of location in the nervous system in spite of residual disease. However, to think of an adult patient with a glioma we almost always assume that whatever gray glioma presents in adulthood, there's an inexorable course of dedifferentiation and malignant transformation, usually over somewhere between 10 and 15 years. This was a 45 year old woman who presented with a right homonymous hemianopsia and was seen at another institution uh, with the scans you see on the left. And you have a tumor that's in the uh, left optic tract and supercellar. She underwent a, she was initially recommended to receive radiation therapy. She declined, came to me for a second opinion. And although she was outside the usual age group, we elected to see what we could do with resection. We achieved a radical resection of the tumor and indeed it was a typical pilocytic astrocytoma. Two years after surgery, we saw a small cystic enlargement, but the solid tumor otherwise remained stable. Eight years after surgery, the tumor spontaneously involuted, and 20 years after surgery, you cannot see any enhancing tumor, and you have these uh, residual cystic structures. She is now 27 years out of surgery. We recently published this as a case report in Journal of Neurosurgery in 2020. And I actually just had dinner with her a few months ago 
Uh, she skis, she drives a car, she runs her own business uh, and has been uh, neurologically otherwise stable for 27 years with surgery alone. So again, this speaks to the unusual biologic nature of tumors in this location, even in a select group of adult patients. About 40% of the patients had large tumors arising in the third ventricle. Our approach was transcolosal with frameless stereotaxy, almost always working through the foramen of Monroe, opening the uh, choroidal fissure as needed. Rarely do we go into fornicil. Um, my experience, I was very fond of interfornicil uh, approaches early on, but as one of my uh, professors once said, the fornices have the elastic, elastic modulus of a tube of toothpaste, and in fact, they're very prone to injury. Once we get through the, for, through the, uh, the uh, Fraven and Monroe, the first thing to do is identify the posterior third ventricle and the normal third ventricle floor, which can almost always be visualized anterior to the aqueduct. Uh, there's an excellent paper on the technique of this from the St. Jude's group, and I put this up for your uh, interest, and you can read this. Um, for some reason, my talk keeps wanting to go backwards. And as I said, through this sort of transcolossal approach, we can do these very radical resections. This was actually a five-year-old boy, uh, a child of a nurse who was noted to be gradually getting closer and closer to the television set to watch his favorite cartoons. Ultimately, he saw an ophthalmologist who demonstrated severe visual loss, who was sent to another hospital where they had said there was nothing to do and offered him palliative care. We did this radical resection and he then remained stable without any adjuvant therapy for about eight years. Unfortunately, at the time that he had some tumor progression, both of his parents died in a motor vehicle accident and his uh, subsequent caregivers elected not to treat him. This was a child who did well initially and probably would have done very well with subsequent adjuvant therapy. Interesting tumors, again, this was another child very early on, the pre-gadolinium era, and one sees that the tumor had different consistencies on this T1 MRI. This is not a cyst, this is solid gelatinous tumor. And we did a radical resection, removing about 60% of the tumor. Uh, she remained stable neurologically, although did require hormone replacement therapy, no new visual deficits, two years post-op, and then without any adjuvant therapy, this tumor continued to shrink very much like the 45 year old I showed you previously. And 11 years post-op, there was no tumor at all. Interestingly, 15 years post-operatively without any evidence of intracranial tumor and receiving no uh, adjuvant therapy, <clears throat> she developed a malignant kidney tumor and ultimately died from that. So this was obviously some form of cancer uh, syndrome that was not appreciated 15 years ago. What was the morbidity? Um, we did have uh, transient diabetes insipidus or SIDH in about 80% of patients. Permanent DI was seen in about 30% and almost exclusively in those patients that we operated on transcolosally, that is resecting tumor through the third ventricle. <clears throat> about 15% in mild obesity. New visual deficits were only seen in 15%. And only three children out of um, the 140 children uh, became blind from the surgery. Um, and again, similar results when we looked at those um, that had previously been treated Neurologic deficits seem to be more common among those who we had as secondary resections <clears throat> and memory deficits and particularly severe memory deficits were mostly uh, restricted to those who had transcolossal tumors and particularly those who had been previously treated with radiation or chemotherapy and came to us for salvage therapy. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we decided to do a deep dive into the patients uh, and try to look at patients where we could get at least five years of follow-up 
So we took the patients between 1984, our very first patient, and 2013. We looked at patients who only had significant resections, resections more than 50%, no one who had a biopsy alone, and only patients who had either polycytic astrocytomas, pilomyxoid astrocytomas, or pleomorphic xanthroastrocytomas. Children with uh, gangliogliomas, which were about 20% of the patients were excluded from this uh, look back. And we assigned them retrospectively to three treatment pathways as described by the Liverpool group uh, several years ago. Um, this was 88 patients out of the uh, uh, overall series of 140 where we had good long-term follow-up with a mean follow-up or median follow-up of 11 years. Uh, slight male predominance, the average age at diagnosis was four years of age. Uh, the average age at treatment was six years, indicating a significant proportion of these patients had previously been treated with chemotherapy. 85% of these were pilocytic astrocytomas and 12% were either pilomyxoid or uh, pleomorphic xanthroastrocytomas. And hypothalamic involvement was seen in 87%. These were how we divided them. Uh, just under half of the patients, about 40%, 45%, resection was the primary treatment without any subsequent adjuvant therapy. And their median progression-free survival was about 84 months and an overall survival of just shy of 10 years. Pathway two, which was resection and then subsequent adjuvant therapy um, had, a, a worse course, and these were almost exclusively children under two years of age, and we'll see them a little bit later. And then pathway three were those who came to us for salvage therapy at the time of progression after previous treatment, either radiation or chemotherapy, and they have an overall survival of about five and a half years, median overall survival. When we looked at the complications in this group, if you look at all complications, they're relatively high, just shy of 40%. However, when we look at those complications that change the quality of life or were permanent, those are about 11%. That is 4% had new disabling visual deficits and 7% had new permanent focal neurologic deficit, either a third nerve palsy or a new hemiparesis. About 12% had hormonal deficits without diabetes and precipitous that were easily managed with replacement therapy. We had one serious infection and we had non-disabling visual deficits. That is uh, a slight decrease in acuity or a partial de uh, visual field deficit, which did not prevent problems with school learning or obtaining a driver's license. Looking at uh, progression-free survival, we see a significant difference in pathology between uh, pilocytic astrocytomas in the green and either pilomyxoid or pleomorphic xanthroastrocytomas with almost tripling of the mean progression-free survival with a pilocytic astrocytoma. If we look according to the pathway, those who came to us for initial resection had roughly a 45% 15 and 20 year progression-free survival without any additional treatment. Those who we treated after other adjuvant therapy had about a 38% 10 and 15 year progression-free survival without additional treatment. And those um, who needed adjuvant therapy upfront ultimately did poorly and as I mentioned, those were largely children under two years of age. And again, you can see uh, these statistics. If you look at progression-free survival by age at diagnosis, again, a very significant change, which probably represents the biology. Those who were less than two years of age did the worst, whereas those who were over six years of age did the best. Uh, and this was strongly statistically significant. If you're over six years of age, the tumors were almost exclusively exophytic, uh, 
The optic nerves were rarely involved. These were chiasmatic, exophytic, and hypothalamic exophytic. And nearly 60% of these children could achieve prolonged progression-free survival, going to 15 and 20 years with resection alone. And again, uh, looking at overall survival, it's even more dramatic with 75% of children who are over six years of, uh, of age at treatment and had surgery as their initial and only treatment remaining alive and well uh, 20 years after initial therapy. Um, and again, if we look at just the pilocytic astrocytomas, sorting out the bad actors, we again see this dramatic difference with age, polycytic astrocytomas in the older children, both on progression-free and overall survival do far better. In terms of long-term visual, excuse me, visual outcome, among those who presented with normal vision, um, two or 15% were worse with non-disabling deficits. Those who had impaired vision, about 14% improved 60% remained stable, and 25% were worse, usually with a new field cut. Interestingly, among those who presented blind, visual acuity of, of finger counting or worse, 17% of them improved by decompressing the optic nerves by resecting the exophytic component. Looking very quickly at other non-surgical series that came out Contemporaneously with this population, the group from Children's Hospital in Philadelphia pre presented by Dr. Jans in 1995, they had 46 patients. A large number of these were NF patients, unlike our population. Most were treated with chemotherapy. Most had radiation therapy. Two-thirds had endocrine deficits. Two-thirds required special education, particularly after radiation, and about 10% were dead and 10% were blind at five years of follow-up. Dr. Packer, who promulgated the use of carboplatin and vincristine chemotherapy beginning in the mid eighties, uh, presented the children's cancer group phase one, two study back in 1996. Uh, 60 of his patients were, would be within this realm of exophytic chiasmatic hypothalamic tumors or diffuse tumors of the optic chiasm. Using carboplatin and vincristine, he demonstrated excellent response. That is about 40% had complete uh, response or partial response greater than 50% shrinkage. 60% had either complete response, partial response, or minimal response. So this showed incredible efficacy for the first time in chemotherapy in these tumors. The problem is at three years, we were down to 65 progression-free survival, and it looked like the efficacy dropped off very rapidly. This phase one, two trial led to the children's oncology group randomized trial where two different chemotherapies were used, carboplatin and christine and TPCV. Um, and here we had 274 patients, and we see that uh, the yellow was the TPCV, the blue was the carboplatin vincristine, and you can see, again, similar results to what Dr. Packer showed in the non-randomized phase one, two study, that you had about uh, 60, 65% uh, progression-free survival at three years after initiation of therapy, However, that dropped off so that by 10 years, only 30% of patients with carboplatin and 40% of patients with the TPCV remained with progression-free survival. And that was in fact worse than the children who were treated with, uh, with surgery alone. Now, one of the caveats is that this study was heavily weighted to children diffuse tumors and children under two years of age, we've seen are biologically more active or perhaps more malignant. Um, one other 
surgical study. This was the study that I led for the children's oncology group where we had over 725 children with low-grade gliomas. Surgical therapy alone followed up to 10 years. Uh, the cosmetic tumors were a small number because this ran concurrent with the previous study on carboplatin and Christine and TPCV. But among those 23 tumors, very similar results to what we've shown in our institutional study, about a 55% eight-year progression-free survival with surgery alone. So where does the future go? Well, we all know the future is in molecular therapy. Um, BRAF uh, was first described over a decade ago and active BRAF inhibitors have gone from clinical trials to clinical use as standard therapy. Um, to remind everyone of the pathways, we're really looking at these two parts in the RAS-RAF pathway that is to inhibit BRAF or to inhibit downstream MEK inhibitors if you do not have the appropriate mutation of BRAF. Um, and again, this was from the Heidelberg group, um, one of the early uh, groups identifying BRAF inhibitors. And those who had the BRAF fusion, regardless of location in the nervous system, had significantly improved progression-free survival, uh, both with and without treatment. So what conclusions can I bring to you after talking about surgical therapy? Um, I don't believe this is just looking backwards with a fond memory of surgery before effective chemotherapy or molecular therapies, but rather thinking that most optic pathway gliomas are going to be a chronic disease. At different points within the disease, different therapies are appropriate. Prechiasmatic optic nerve gliomas when vision is no longer functional or when the globe is threatened or when they escape control from chemotherapy or targeted therapy are surgically curable tumors and one should not hesitate to resect these. One of the few tumors that are gliomas that can be absolutely cured. Diffuse tumors are rarely amenable to surgical resection. Um, resection does carry risk of causing significant visual deficit However, biopsy may be appropriate for molecular diagnosis and targeted therapy. You should consider biopsy in these diffuse tumors when there's an atypical presentation, particularly diabetes insipidus. Um, remember, germ cell tumor, histiocytosis, sarcoidosis can all mimic these tumors, and these tumors can mimic uh, germ cell sarcoidosis and histiocytosis. Exophytic tumors, particularly in older children over six years of age, are amenable to aggressive radical resection, and we can achieve long-term progression-free survival without adjuvant therapy in a significant number of these patients. It's not the only treatment, but I do believe it's one that should be considered, uh, particularly in areas where either for socioeconomic reasons or other targeted molecular therapies are not available. And ultimately, perhaps molecular diagnosis will not only identify those that will respond to BRAF and MEK inhibitors, but also perhaps those that with surgical resection will be better candidates for long-term progression-free survival. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Wissoff. This was an outstanding lecture and a great opening to the 2021 IWBNC. We have a few questions from the audience. Dr. Ramirez asks, which is the performance of liquid biopsies, CSF biopsies, when germ cell tumor of the output nerve is suspected? Um, you know, liquid biopsy is still, uh, in basically a phase one, phase two status. Um, it would be a remarkable uh, advance, but I think it's a treatment that at least at this point in time uh, is, not, is not a standard of care by any means. I would hesitate to use liquid biopsy out of a protocol situation. Um, the overall accuracy and efficacy of liquid biopsy remains unknown. 
It's also something that does require relatively sophisticated uh, molecular diagnosis. So you have to have a laboratory that's dedicated and can give you a rapid turnover. Um, we didn't talk a lot about biopsy, but definitely uh, a very efficacious way of obtaining biopsy, particularly in uh, chiasmatic tumors that bulge into the third ventricle is with an endoscopic uh, approach through the lateral and third ventricle. Um, not everything needs an open craniotomy for biopsy. Okay, thank you. Dr. Madrian asks, which are the most frequent complications from intraorbital chiasmatic glioma surgery? Well, obviously the child will be blind in that eye afterwards, but that's not a complication. That's either given preoperatively. Um, I think one of the dangers, which I have not experienced, but what is well described in the literature, is damaging the vascular supply of the globe and ultimately losing the globe and requiring enucleation. Um, it is far better to have a blind eye with an intact globe than a nucleation, because that creates long-term problems, particularly for these children. So I think uh, care uh, not to damage the vascular supply to the globe is critical. Um, and that would be the most common complication that I've seen. The other one that has been described is pulsatile exophthalmos. Um, this usually uh, can be easily uh, uh, avoided by either using a bone graft or a wire mesh graft or a synthetic graft to recreate the posterior orbital roof after your resection. Thank you very much. Dr. Andraus asks, Dr. Wisoff, thank you for the excellent lecture regarding tumors with intimate relation with the optic nerve pathway. Any technical recommendations you may have in order to reduce possible injuries to this nerve? Yeah, I think first and foremost, uh, you need to be able to see the normal optic nerves when you resect exophytic tumors. And we're talking about those that you're going to go from a terional or some people prefer a subfrontal approach, not the, uh, the uh, transventricular approach. I think stereotactic navigation is absolutely critical. That way you always leave a carpet of tumor above the area where the chiasm should be and where presumably the hypothalamus should be. Again, we're not going for total resection. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, when you're going from a terional or subfrontal approach, it's often hard to initially identify what is chiasm, what is nerve. If you identify your vascular anatomy, that gives you an enormously valuable landmark. Uh, the anterior cerebral artery will always be intimately related to the area of the chiasm, even when it's expanded and distorted. And the internal carotid would be lateral to the optic nerve. Thank you very much. There's another question which radiologic or anatomic elements should be taken into account for an optic nerve biopsy? Um, well, I, I would say optic, I think it's rare that one would biopsy the optic nerve alone, um, unless we're talking about intraorbital optic nerve enlargement that's atypical. Uh, if you have an atypical uh, Op, intraorbital optic nerve tumor, then a lateral orbitotomy and biopsy is feasible. I have seen some ophthalmologists who have attempted to internally resect intraorbital tumors rather than do a total resection. And those have largely been useless. If you're a progressive optic nerve glioma, intraorbital optic nerve glioma, uh, partial resection does not seem to be efficacious. In terms of biopsying, uh, an open approach through a terional or subfrontal. The key is to identify the area of the normal optic nerves on either side and to stay as midline as possible and as superior as possible. Going uh, transventricular, and now we usually biopsy transventricular using the endoscope, you just want to stay as superficial as possible. Thank you. Another question. Um, could you give us any recommendations or technical nuances for Sylvian Fisher split in children? 
Yeah, actually, you know, unlike uh, an ancient person like myself, uh, the Sylvian Fisher is relatively tight in, in a young child. Uh, but again, I, I think it's mostly a matter of patience. You can almost always find the fissure uh, in any child over about six years of age. Uh, babies, sometimes the fissure is pseudo-fused, uh, in which case you just, rather than start lateral, start a bit more proximal. Uh, take time. Uh, opening the Sylvian fissure, I find, is a wonderful way of um, accommodating to working under the scope. If you have any minor tremor, it gives you time for the tremor to accommodate and disappear. So spend a few minutes opening the fissure. Do not rush through it. Um, and usually it, it's found. Uh, always keep um, the veins on the temporal side. That helps. Uh, it's more a matter of patience than anything else. Thank you. Uh, another attendee says, thank you very much for the lecture, Dr. Wiesoff. What is the role of primary surgery and the benefit for children under two years with tumors with palomaxoid characteristics? I think there's really very little indication for these young children in terms of radical resection. Uh, most of the children under two years of age that I operated on were before 1997. And those children uh, had this inexorable progression. Uh, we had done a, uh, another Kaplan-Meier analysis back in 2000. And the difference between the under two and the over two in and of itself was dramatic as was shown a little bit less uh, in one of the slides I presented earlier. I think for children under two years of age, uh, biopsy is going to be much more useful, particularly an endoscopic biopsy to determine whether or not targeted therapy would be appropriate. Okay. Another attendee says, thank you for such a wonderful lecture. What is the long-term benefit of resection for both primary treatment and second line treatment after primary treatment failure in optimum in the pathway gliomas. So again, to a large extent, age of diagnosis will determine the long-term benefit, regardless of whether you're doing primary therapy or recurrent salvage therapy. Um, those tumors that present under two years of age tend to also diffusely involve the optic nerves, unlike those that present over two years of age. Definitely over six years of age, if you have an exophytic component, then the likelihood of resecting the exophytic components and achieving a prolonged progression-free survival is at least uh, 50 to 60%. Since these are chronic tumors, even if you achieve five or seven years of uh, progression-free survival, it may defer the amount of time until other adjuvant therapy is needed uh, 10 years from now, I'm certain the adjuvant therapies will be vastly different and vastly more uh, effective than what we have today. So again, choose the therapy, be it chemotherapy, targeted therapy, or surgery that seems to match the child's clinical status and the anatomic nature of what you can identify on the MRI scan. Okay. Um, it says, thank you, Dr. Wissoff. What is the role of interoperative MRI for guiding the resection of these prechiasmatic optic tumors? Um, I think that's an excellent question. Uh, we've now been using the interoperative MRI for the last three years. Uh, it's helped me, I think, with those tumors that we resect transcolosal that are largely filling the third ventricle. Um, as you go transcolosal and uh, transforaminal, the more anterior aspect of the tumor in the third ventricle is harder to visualize. Uh, and I think the interoperative MRI is useful there to help define the limits, whether or not when we think we've got out as much as we can, we can go back and get out a bit more safely. Again, all of these are partial resections, so it becomes a bit philosophic, whether it's 50, 60, 70, or 80% of the tumor that needs to be removed. 
and I don't have that data and I don't think anyone else does. Um, for the supracellar tumors that were going uh, terional or orbitozygomatic, most of those you reach your limit of resection based upon your visualization. Uh, we do use the intraoperative MRI post resection, but I've yet to find that that has changed my operative management. Okay. Another question and the final question. Um, what do you think about radiosurgery in chiasmatic hypothalamic gliomas in pediatric patients? I, I think radiation should be avoided at all costs. Uh, radiosurgery, I mean, radiosurgery is very efficacious in certain cases, but I think of radiosurgery as essentially burning a hole in whatever your target is. If you're going to burn a hole in the center of your um, optic chiasm, you're going to have severe deficit. Among all of the children we have treated, uh, only the ones who have had radiation therapy have had either malignant degeneration, dedifferentiation, and died from their tumor, or have gone on to develop Moya Moya disease and had secondary vascular injury. So I think all forms of radiation, although definitely efficacious, should be your last line therapy. So depending upon the age, it's either upfront chemotherapy or surgery, second treatment um, surgery or molecular targeted therapy, third treatment chemotherapy, molecular therapy, fourth line treatment is radiation. Okay, on behalf of the CN, I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Wissa. Uh, this has been a remarkable lecture. We're really grateful and honored for your participation in the 2021 IWBNC. It was a pleasure. Thank you and have a good day to everybody. Okay. For all the audience, keep in mind this lecture will be available on our website starting next week. In a few minutes, we will have Dr. Atul Goel doing his lecture, Designing Surgical Strategy for Complex Brain Tumors. To get the link for this upcoming conference, please follow the link pinned on the chat screen or check the program schedule on our website, cnhus.com. Thank you.